Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I'm here to talk about the Roman Empire, specifically the fall of the Roman Empire. And uh, before I get started with that, I want to do a few disclaimers. First of all, I am not a historian. I don't claim to be a historian. I am just a history buff who really loves Roman history. And he said that I could come here and ramble on about it. And so I jumped at the chance. Secondly, I'm not a professional speaker. I'd never done this before. So please bear with me if I stumble or if I say something stupid. Also, history is murky. It's very difficult to say what ac actually happened, especially in ancient times. Um, it's impossible to say what actually happened. Uh, so keep that in mind as I go. Uh, in addition to history being murky, even if it wasn't murky, it's always very complicated. So even if we knew everything that happened, there would still be endless debate as to why it happened and what caused and what it led to. So keep that in mind as well. If anybody disagrees with me on something that I say, if you're a history buff and you go, I don't agree with that, please bring that up in the comment section, in the question section. I would love to hear your thoughts. Lastly, the title of this talk was vague, advantageously vague. Um, I'm not actually going to talk about the fall of the Roman Empire in general. I'm going to focus on inflation. Um, I'm going to focus on the debasement of their currency and how and why that happened, as well as what I think the results were. So those are the disclaimers. Moving on. I want to start with uh, just a little recap of the timeline of forms of money, just a very basic overview of how money developed. First is the barter system. That's the most basic form of money is I give you chickens, you give me pigs or whatever. Um, that eventually leads into pr bartering precious metals. So. Um, before coins get developed, people start using precious metals exclusively for money, and they simply go off of a weight system. So um, before coins were uh, implemented in um, West Asia, so Babylon, ooh, that sucks. Uh, he just had a beer explode on him. <laughs> um, so before coins were implemented, people used precious metals, but merchants had scales, and they would simply weigh the metals and people, they found hordes of precious metals of silver in different chunks, different sized chunks that people kept track of. Um, but obviously that gets a little bit cumbersome having to weigh the metal that you're accepting from your customers all the time. So eventually they switch over to coinage. And usually this coinage starts out as pure precious metal. Basically an entity, usually a government, takes it upon themselves to standardize a certain size and distribute those coins, generally for advertisement purposes. It's a really great form of advertisement um, if your face is on a bunch of coins. And it also helps the merchants because now they can trust, oh, you just hand me a coin. I know exactly how much silver is in this. I'm just going to drop it in my coffer, and we're good to go. Uh, eventually, though, that goes bad, which is we'll see, we'll see that. Um, so this is, this is the area that we're going to be focusing on is coins, precious metal coins. Uh, but I figured I'd finish the timeline and say that coins generally lead into the usage of banknotes because of weight and uh, just ease purposes. And uh, after banknotes get all fucked up by the uh, government, hopefully it goes to crypto. That's a bit of wishful thinking, though, so we'll see. Um, so that's basically where, that's basically how money develops in a society, or at least in Western society. Now, a uh, brief overview of the Ro Roman history. So uh, we're basically focusing on the thousand years to either side of the birth of Christ. Uh, in 753 BC, the city of Rome is founded. There's plenty of legends surrounding it that are probably or definitely not true. Um, but archaeology has found early settlements around this time. So the Romans did get the time period right for the founding of Rome. They didn't get the actual method of its finding right. Um, but anyways, that's when Rome is started, and it starts out as a kingdom. Um, Romulus is the first king, and it leads through for seven kings. Again, there was probably far more than seven kings, but those are the ones that we remember. In 509 BC, they kick the kings out of the city, 
and they, all of the Romans take an oath to never allow a king to rule in Rome ever again. Um, and they do pretty well at keeping that oath. Uh, they keep it for about a little under 500 years, they keep that oath. Um, and they do really well. They conquer the Mediterranean uh, as a republic. A lot of people say that the Roman Empire conquered the Mediterranean. It's definitely not true. The vast majority of the land that Rome controlled for its history was conquered when it was a republic. Um, Britain is uh, an exception. That was after the start of the empire. So around 27 BC, we all, this is the part of the history that mostly everybody knows. Julius Caesar uh, very deftly takes power, um, is assassinated for it, leaves all of his titles and all of his wealth to his great nephew, Octavian. He adopts him, so Octavian becomes his son in the eyes of Romans and Octavian becomes the first official emperor of Rome called Augustus. Um, Octavian leads his, leaves his, the empire to his descendants. They rule for about 100 years, and then the Nero is the last one. Everybody hates him. They kill him, and then there's about 18 months of strife, and then another dynasty rises up, takes power, they last for another hundred years, and this cycle pretty much continues three times, basically. Uh, dynasty rises, lasts for a hundred years, falls, there's a bunch of chaos, another dynasty rises, lasts for a hundred years. So that goes all the way until 476 AD, which is generally known as the end of the Roman Empire. Um, this is so this is definitely up for debate, actually. It's absolutely up for debate. This is the date that Rome was sacked by a bunch of uh, Gauls, so Frenchmen, basically. Nice. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so this is the, when people generally say that the Roman Empire fell. But the Byzantine Empire went on for another thousand years after this, and they called themselves Roman. We are the only ones who call, call them Byzantine. When they existed, they called themselves Roman, but they were so different that we distinguish between the two. So anyways, so that's a brief history of, of uh, Rome. We're gonna be focusing on the time period between 0 AD and 300 AD, with a little wiggle room on either side. Um, the reason being, the first emperor, Augustus, doesn't die until 14 AD, and that's when the debasement really starts slowly and then picks up steam all the way up until 300 AD with the edicts of Diocletian, which we will get to. This is where I would say the Roman Empire fell because at, uh, in 306 AD, Constantine takes over. He switches the national religion from paganism to Christianity, and he moves the capital of Rome, from Rome to uh, Constantinople. At the time, it was known as uh, Byzantium. And so that's when I would say that the Roman Empire ended and the Byzantine Empire began. That's why we call them the Byzantines, because their capital was in Byzantium. So during the reign of Augustus, Augustus was a pretty smart guy. He was a very smart guy. Um, he took power in a very subtle way that allowed all of the Romans to go on believing that they still lived in a republic. It's a very scary story, and I would encourage anybody who's interested in it to look into this section of history to really see how power can be taken subtly, and, and it's just very crafty how he did it, and whatever parallels you see with our time will scare the shit out of you. It's a lot like what we have now, absolutely, yes. Um, I would say we're a little bit behind this. I would say, I love, when I'm learning about Roman history, I love trying to match it up with American history. Um, it doesn't always work, but it's uncanny how similar it can be. So I would say we're still, we haven't gotten to this point yet. But anyways, what I wanna talk about is the coinage because I think that's a major, major, aspect of what caused the Republic to fall. It was both a symptom and a cause. It was sort of a, I mean, a, with all economics, things sort of get rolling and sort of cause themselves. It's self-fulfilling prophecies are all over in e economics. And so I think that the debasement of the coinage was both a cause and, a, and an effect of the fall of Rome. So when Augustus dies in 14 AD, 
The main coin that Romans use, called the denarius, is their silver coin. They have a gold coin, but that's only used to store wealth. It's not used for exchange or anything. The, um, I will say the uh, difference between the price of silver and the price of gold that we see now, that's been a pretty general trend throughout history. Silver has always been quite a bit uh, less expensive as gold, and so you'll find that silver has been what's been used for everyday exchanges, and gold has been generally, generally been used for a store of value. So when Augustus dies, he leaves, uh, he leaves a will that says two things. Um, well, it says more than two things, but two of the things that it says is don't expand the empire beyond its current bounds, which they basically, they listen to pretty, pretty closely, and also don't ruin the currency. And they didn't listen to that very closely. Um, but th they started out good. So when he died, their denariuses were 95% silver. Very high quality silver, especially for the time, very high quality coins, I mean, especially for the time. Um, after he dies, his uh, family rules for, like I said, about 100 years. Um, well, uh, yeah, uh, more like 50 years from here. He ruled for 50 years uh, before this, so. The whole uh, Julian dynasty was 100 years. So after he dies, they generally take his advice. They don't destroy the currency. Pompey is destroyed, or uh, uh, Pompey is destroyed in 79 AD. And when that happens, there's some temporary uh, uh, debasement. Um, but after uh, the proceeds are used to help the Pompeians that are displaced by the eruption of Vesuvius. So after that, they go right back up to, uh, I think, 93%. So they keep it pretty steady for another 50 years. Um, after, after the uh, Julian dynasty falls, after Nero is assassinated, there's 18 months of chaos. And out of that, the Severan dynasty rises. That lasts for three generations. That's where the, uh, the Pompey was destroyed, so the emperor at the time debased the currency then, but then it went back. Then that dynasty fell, and uh, the next dynasty rose up, uh, the Antonine dynasty, and that is called the period of the five good emperors. Now that's a bit of an oxymoron for this group, uh, but they were better than other emperors. They weren't as bad, yeah, exactly. Um, and they, you know, the one area where they did not really do very well is they debased the currency quite a bit. Um, it was uh, becoming more difficult to plunder enemies, especially when you're not allowed to expand the borders of Rome. So they were running out of money to plunder, and the silver mines in Spain and Britain were becoming less productive. And so in order to offset that, they debased the currency over the course of about 100 years from 93% to about 78% silver. Not great, but it's definitely not as bad as it gets, as you will see. Um, so, uh, and, and when uh, uh, archeologists look at the evidence of what prices did over that time, they see an inflation that is perfectly in line with the debasement. Everybody here knows why that's obvious and why you don't really need to check that. <laughs> that's obviously gonna happen. So over this period, it's uh, relatively peaceful in Rome. Um, and uh, everybody's having a great time. The prices are going up steadily, but it's slow enough to where nobody really notices and nobody really cares. Um, then Commodus comes along, which we all know who Commodus is. We've all seen Gladiator. Commodus was the son of the last good emperor. It's the first emperor of this dynasty to give the empire to his son. The four previous emperors made a point to when they were getting old, they found a good candidate for emperor somewhere in the empire and they adopted him and made him their son and he became the next emperor. And that's the general uh, assumption of why they were so good at ruling the empire was because it was mostly, uh, they were chosen by merit and not by heredity. Um, Marcus Aurelius fucks all that up gives the empire to Commodus, and Commodus goes insane, um, killing people, having good time, you know, all the stuff that you saw in Gladiator wasn't absolutely accurate, but it got the gist. He was basically 
that much of a pompous asshole. So he goes on to debase the currency quite a bit. Uh, he doesn't do it too much, but he gets killed pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, and the fighting and the people who rise up after him um, debase the currency quite a bit. Now, why do they debase the currency? Well, basically one reason to pay their soldiers because this is a system that is simply based on military power. That is where the emperors gain, get their power. They know that that's where they get their power. And so every single time a new emperor rises, uh, they have to pay what's called a donative to every single soldier in the empire. And this usually was on the on par with about an entire year's pay for the soldier. They would just get a bonus for that. Not only did they have to pay donatives uh, when they came to power, but they also usually had to raise the pay for the soldiers as well. Uh, and this obviously became absolutely necessary because of the inflation that the soldiers were experiencing um, because of the debasement. So. After this period, this period of the five good emperors, there is a period called the, oh, I'm sorry. In between, uh, Caracalla introduces uh, one of the emperors who is in power for a uh, few years, introduces a coin that is worth two denarius. This is clever. It's worth two denarius, but it only has the amount of silver of one and a half denarius, which is pretty, pretty clever by him. So that lowers the the silver content of those coins down to 56 percent. So we've gone from 95 percent to 78 percent over the course of two centuries, and then within 35 years we go from 78 down to 56. So we can see it's picking up steam. Um, after Caracalla and uh, I believe his son was assassinated. Um, we have the crisis of the third century. Now in Rome, in the third century, it was absolute hell. There was constant infighting, constant um, civil wars. At one point, the, uh, here, let me, at one point the, oh, come on. Oh, goodness. All right. At one point, the empire splits into three. So France and Germany, then known as Gaul, becomes its own empire. Its soldiers declare their favorite general as the emperor, and that splits off. Also, down here, the eastern uh, empire splits off. If you've ever heard of Zenobia, that she was involved in that. Um, uh, so the entire empire is in chaos. Um, huge amounts of infighting. Every couple of months or maybe every year, a new emperor is declared. And of course, this emperor has to pay his soldiers a large donative and raise their salaries. So every emperor debases the currency. Um, every emperor increases his taxes on his people because he doesn't really give a fuck about them. It's the soldiers that he cares about. And he debases the shit out of the currency because that's what he's using to pay his soldiers. So, by the end of the crisis of the third century, we go from 56% to 2% silver. And this is over the course of 50 years. And at, so now at this time, the currency is absolutely destroyed. And you can see that as the currency got more and more debased, chaos just became ubiquitous across the empire. And we all can see why that would happen. You know, people are pissed at rising prices, especially soldiers, and so they're looking for anybody who promises to fix it or promises just to make it better for them, even if he doesn't fix it for anyone else. So um, at the end of the crisis of the third century, that is when Diocletian comes to power. Now, Diocletian is who I really want to talk about because his reforms are um, familiar. They will be familiar to us. Uh, so he rises out of the crisis of the third, third century, and he implements some economic reforms, one of which is to bring the currency back to 5%. That was considered a huge, a huge win, is, oh yay, now it's only 5%. Um, 
not a great not a great accomplishment for us, but at the time it was very very uh, important. So that was one good thing that he did. The rest of his, the stuff that he did was absolutely horrible. This is Diocletian's economic reforms, or like what I like to call it, what not to do. Um, Diocletian implemented price ceilings. We all know what happens there, right? Uh, yeah, he released a list of about a thousand different products and services and said, if you charge more than this amount for that product, I will kill you. And um, yeah, <laughs> not very different. I, f I think it's a common trend among emp empires. Um, it didn't really work, uh, obviously. The same with every other time they've done it. The black market exploded. It was pretty much unenforceable. And in the process of enforcing it, a lot of valuable Romans were just murdered needlessly. So he repealed that part uh, a few years later um, because not everybody's completely stupid. Um, he also uh, instituted some heavily regressive taxation uh, to the point where senators didn't have to pay any taxes and everybody else absolutely did. And now this is at a time when he's also completely reforming the army and building massive fortifications along Rome's borders. And so to pay all that, he's not just taxing Roman citizens you know, moderately, he is taxing the shit out of them to the point where most of the most farmers lose their land and have to give it to the uh, the senators of their province. And so, Diocletian is really credited with creating the middle, the Dark Ages, creating feudalism, creating the hellhole that was Europe between the fall of the Roman Empire and uh, you know, I guess the Renaissance. You know, there's different opinions on when it got better. Um, so heavily regressive, regressive taxation. Another thing he did was he started taxing in kind. The coins were so worthless that the government decided we don't even we don't want them. We don't want them back. So you have to pay your taxes with mules or hay or olives or whatever you grow or own. We'll take that. We don't want the coins. Um, he also instituted, and this is pretty hilarious, he instituted a fixed price system based on kind. So forget about the coins, five chickens equals one mule equals 10 bales of hay. He had an entire system worked out of exchange rates between goods. It didn't work, it was absolutely unwieldy. It was dumb, very, very, very dumb. Uh, another thing that he did was he instituted hereditary professions. A lot of people don't know this. This is really where feudalism comes from. He made it illegal for you to change your profession and also your sons had to go into that profession as well. A lot of people think this is where we get the last names related to the professions of people. You know, bakers take on the last name of baker because that's what the family did and they weren't allowed to do anything else. Um, this had horrible, horrible consequences, and really, I do believe, caused the Dark Ages. Um, it, it pretty much invented serfdom. Uh, another thing he did was he institutionalized the dominate. Now, this is some gobbledygook here. He basically, that, um, that lie that Romans had been telling themselves this whole time, that they still lived in a republic, and the emperor was just, he was just the head guy who kept his eye on things for us. That was over with Diocletian. Diocletian told the senators they could still call themselves senators, but they're not going to have any input in what we do. I'm going to have all the say, or at least me and my partners that I choose are going to have all the say. So this is where Rome becomes an absolute monarchy, and obviously this is, this is where I think they went absolutely wrong. Um, and so uh, Diocletian uh, institutes all these horrible reforms, and they just caused the republic, or the, they caused the empire to continue this downward spiral um, into oblivion to the point where, uh, and to uh, uh, illustrate where it was at at the time, when Diocletian came to power, he could not find, he wanted to build all these statues to commemorate his victories and all this stuff. Uh, he could not find across the entirety of the empire a sculptor with the skills to make his likeness and spread them around the empire. He had to actually take 
sculptures of Tra Trajan, who was the first or the second of the five good emperors, and and just put his name on them and say that these are mine. So the empire was in such a state at the time that there were no artisans. There was very little specialization. It was very agrarian at this point, um, even more agrarian than normal in ancient times uh, because of probably just the debasement. I mean, currency is what allows you to specialize and turn that specialization into value that you can then trade for other goods. And when you destroy the currency, you destroy people's ability to do that. And so uh, he, uh, he came into a shit show and he made it way, way worse. Um, and then after him, uh, Constantine uh, instituted Christianity, moved the capital to Con uh, Constantinople, and um, we get the rest of the fall of the Roman Empire after that, and what leads into what was called the Dark Ages, and now they call it the Early Middle Ages, because it's not PC to call it Dark Ages, I guess. Um, and so, and so that, is, that is my story of the fall of the Roman Empire from the aspect of currency debasement. The, the progression, I think, is the most stark thing about it. It's almost, I mean, I'm pretty sure if you graphed this, it would be a perfect, you know, you know logarithmic drop in, in value. As they debased it, they had to debase it more. And as they debased it more, they had to debase it more after that. And it really destroyed the empire's ability to do the thing that had caused it to become great, which was allowing people to specialize and to um, profit from their toil, uh, as somebody somebody in history said that I can't I can't remember. Um, let me see here. I don't think I have very much after that. That is it. Uh, oh, so. One thing I want to make clear is that ancients were not ignorant of economics or monetary policy. A lot of people think that they were. A lot of people attribute that to all of the horrible decisions that they made, but people have been making hor tyrants have been making horrible decisions like this throughout history, even after the publication of The Wealth of Nations. It didn't change shit. Uh, and, and to sort of illustrate their understanding of economics and uh, monetary policy, I wanted to point out this quote from Cicero. Cicero was a Roman politician who lived during the rise of Julius Caesar and the rise of Augustus, so right when the Republic was falling. And this question that he asks is an interesting question, but I'm not too interested in the answer to the question, but what his asking of it illustrates about his knowledge. So he says, Suppose that a good man had brought a large quantity of, coin, or of corn from Alexandria to Rhodes at a time when corn was extremely expensive among, among the Rhodians because of a shortage and famine. So this right here illustrates that he knows what causes prices. He knows what changes prices. He knows that shortages are connected to rises in prices. He goes on to say, uh, he's bringing a large quantity of corn. If he also knows that several more merchants had set sail from Alexandria and had seen their boats en route laden with corn and heading for Rhodes, would he tell the Rhodians? And so he's asking a question about a good man. And so he's basically, this was the way they formed questions. They wanted to ask, who, if you considered somebody a good man, how would they react to this situation? But this also demonstrates an understanding that prices also drive action. He knows that if prices of corn went up in roads, plenty of Alexandrian corn merchants are going to load up their boats and head to roads. It's a, an understanding of economics that I was surprised by. I, um, you know, lots of people take Aristotle's view of economics as the ancient view of economics. It was basically a communist view. Um, that's not true. There were communists. There were free marketers. There was a good mix, the same as there is today, and uh, people weren't idiots. They, they knew some stuff. So um, he said, would the good man keep silent and sell his own produce at a high price, at as high a price as possible? Um, so uh, again, it's an interesting question. I would love to hear your guys' thoughts. But it's, uh, the reason I point it out is to really um, 
sort of point out the economic savviness of people. You can't blame their ignorance on why they destroyed their empire. You can blame tyranny and greed as you usually can. So that's it. That's my whole spiel. I think I, how long did that go? Was that good? Any questions? Leif? What happened to, what happened to physical? Ooh. Button on the bottom? Test. Test. Yeah, it's for the recording. What happened to physical silver during this time span? How much of it was embodied in an increasing volume of coinage, and how much of it went elsewhere? Well, um, so most of the silver in the Roman Empire was used for coinage. Um, the amount that was in the coinage was, is, oh my these percentages here represent the amount of silver in the denarius, which is the main silver coin. And so this was what they used. If they had more silver, they would have used it for more coins. So the vast majority of silver was going to coinage. There was luxury items, obviously, but the emperors own all of the silver mines in the Roman Empire. And so they decide what happens, what happens with that silver, and they decided to put it towards coinage. Does that answer your question? Okay. It's, it's part of an answer. Okay. Uh, can you rephrase the question? Well, you have <laughs> you have said that a lot of the physical weight of silver went into an increased volume of coinage. I'm wondering if there was fugitive silver that went outside of the coinage and created a black market in silver of some sort. Uh, yes, okay. So this is perfect. So um, at the time that Caracalla introduced this double denarius, this Antoninianus, don't worry about that. It's a $2 bill, basically. When he instituted that, everybody knew that it was worth far less than the previous coins. And at this time, they people started hoarding the previous coin, coins that were minted. And so that's where a lot of the silver went was people hoarded good coins and used bad coins to trade with. So you can, you can see that that is what was used in the, black in the black markets. Basically, from this time on, merchants basically went back to using weight as their, as their value determinant. Um, they determined how much silver was in the coins and changed their prices accordingly. But yes, what happened to the good silver is it got hoarded and um, the bad silver is what people traded around. So, uh, and that obviously exacerbated the problem quite a bit. Yes. Hey, any idea why he brought it back up to 5% before not accepting the currency anymore? Um, it was probably, probably politics. Everybody knew that the currency was shit, and so it would be um, good PR to, e to appear to try and restore the, uh, the integrity of the currency. I don't know if you're coming through on the mic, but... Oh. How do... How do we know what the percentages were? Like, we have those. We have coins. Um, the coins were produced in great amounts, and almost uh, examples of almost every single coin have made it to our days. So we can analyze those coins uh, to determine how much silver is in them. Why just don't raise taxes instead of uh, making your coins? Worth. I'm sorry, what? Why don't just rise taxes? Why emperors cannot, could not rise taxes instead of? Uh, Bad PR, basically. Um, emperors, their power comes from the, the their power comes from the soldier. But uncontrollable rebellions aren't profitable. It's not good to piss off all of your subjects. But uh, the same situation when you. Uh, debase your money. Yes, but it, there's a delay. You get to spend the money before anybody knows it's been debased. And so it's a, it's 
the same reason that they do it today, because it's a nice, subtle way to steal from your, from your uh, subjects without them knowing about it immediately. They see prices rising, but they don't know exactly why prices are rising until the end of the crisis of the third century. Okay, so it means that raising taxes produces crisis immediately, but uh, debased money produces a crisis after. Exactly. Okay, yep. thank you. Yep. What's up? You can hide it much easier. Yep. All the same Let's just have you use it. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, all the same reasons. It's, it's very, it, when you look into this kind of stuff, it's very, very, it feels very familiar. Um, it's kind of disheartening because... It's uh, like, have we learned nothing? But, I mean, people have learned. It's just they're not the ones in power. The people in power, and the people in power know, but it's just easy. It's easy to debase your currency to steal from your subjects. Go ahead. Is there a, uh, like, who's representing the ruling party or something at the time that would fight against this debasement? Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure there were some people who spoke out against it. Um, but you're not going to, during the time of the emperors, it's not good for your health to be very radical. <laughs> you're going to catch a cold pretty quick. Um, and also, you, the Senate doesn't control the coinage. The Senate has nothing to do with the coinage. The emperor owns all of the silver mines. These are, um, it's not like today where the money represents the government. The money literally represents the emperor. It's his money that he's given out to the people for them to use. So it's, uh, it, there's really nothing anybody would have been able to do about it, even if they wanted to. JD? JD. Yes. Exactly, absolutely. And also, remember, Cicero lived in, you know, B.C., about, you know, the first century B.C. Up until, you know, the second century A.D., it was still very solid currency. It was still 93% silver. So there was really not much to complain about at that point. Um, when Cicero was alive, that was when the Senate did control the currency, and that's probably why it had such integrity, because there were rival factions inside the Senate during the Republic that would have balanced out any crazy notions um, and would have fought against them. So, but once, once the once Augustus's family dies out, it's all bets are off. You know. Go ahead. Uh, actually, go ahead. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, I think if I can rephrase your question, is the current debasement based off of greed or stupidity? Yeah, cleverness mixed with greed. Yeah, I, it's hard to say. I would like to believe that they're just ignorant. Um, from what I've learned about Keynesian economics, they seem to genuinely think that they're right. I don't understand why they think that they're right. I think it's a bit of, it's very convenient if this is right, so I'm gonna believe it's right. Um, so I think it's a mixture of greed and stupidity. I think it's always been, been that, and including now, I think um, 
But then again, I don't know. I don't like assuming that my enemies are dumb. And so I kind of have a feeling that the people controlling monetary policy know what they're doing. I don't know why they're doing it, though, at, at that point. Exactly. And like in the Roman Empire, by the time we get to this point, they know that debasing the currency is going to have negative effects. But th put yourself in the position of somebody who's just won a civil war, come to power with no legitimacy in the minds of a lot of the uh, uh, citizens of the empire. And the only way he's going to hang on to that power is if he can pay his troops to hold his power for him. And so it's sort of this desperation move of, I just don't have the coins to pay all these guys, but I have to pay them. So we're gonna debase it just a little bit, just a little bit, and then the next guy just a little bit more, and then the next, and when you have a new emperor every few months to a year, every single guy has to debase it a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And so it's something that they're kind of, uh, you know, damned if they do, damned if they don't at that point. So, yeah. Uh, uh, he hasn't asked one yet. Yeah, um, how were the senators selected during this process? Was it given some earlier time for early public to make changes? It's hard, it's hard to say because, um, again, like I said, Augustus was very subtle in his grab for power, so he didn't want to change too much too fast. Senator senatorial status was mostly hereditary anyways. Um, the... Uh, richer uh, families or richer citizens got more of a vote in the elections of senators. And so there, it wasn't really, it wasn't really, um, there wasn't any question of whether or not the, the son of a senator was gonna get elected as a senator. Uh, so that, and that was even in the Republic period. It was a very, uh, you know, exclusive club to be a senator. Um, over, during this period uh, of the five good emperors and Augustus, that generally stays the same. They just don't have as much power. So it's more of a rank of you know, ego um, more than anything. Uh, uh, and, and it's also used by the emperors. The emperors, they, they have ultimate power, really. And so if they decide you're not a senator, this is a good uh, a, a good question, it's gonna take me on a tangent. So there is a um, position in the Roman Republic called the censor. Uh, this is where we get the word census from. He would take a census every 10 years and he would decide who was allowed to be a senator and who wasn't. And this was supposed to be based on virtue. He was supposed to pick out the virtuous men and say, you can continue being a senator and all of the non-virtuous men he could kick out. Well, while Augustus was coming to power, he made himself censor indefinitely. Usually this was an uh, elected position that was, I believe, held for one 10-year period, may have, may have been held for life, but it was elected. But after Augustus, it was just the emperor was, had censorial power. And so the emperor could technically decide, you are not a senator, you are a senator. But if you do that a little too much, you're going to piss people off and cause too many waves. So they still held elections right up until Diocletian did away with the Senate uh, completely. Um, they still held elections, but they were shams. They could serve as a candidate Exactly, yeah. And, and during the fall of the Republic, it was basically, you know, nobody wondered who was gonna win the election. You bribed the people you needed to bribe, and you were elected, and that, and that was that. So, go ahead, yep. So, uh, do, you know Russell Crow? do I know Russell Crowe? <laughs> Copper, usually. So they, uh, it's really interesting, they came up with a lot of dirty tricks to do it. Um, they would have an alloy of copper and silver, and then they, uh, around Caracalla's time, they started using a uh, copper leaching, or a silver leaching process that would take all of the copper on the outer layer and leach that out so that there was an outer layer of silver and then the inner core was silver-copper mixed. And then after, once that 
was too much silver for them to lose, they started just taking copper coins and putting a silver wash on them, what they called. And so that's just a very thin layer. You can see it. I probably should have included some pictures, but if you look at some uh, numismatics, I don't know, the, the hobby of coin collecting, um, there's people who focus on Roman coins, and you can see the quality degrade over time where these coins just become less and less shiny and more just dull and uh, yeah, just bad. So yeah, they mixed it with copper, sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, well, that's a good question. It's kind of, uh, I guess it's kind of an accident and kind of, it just kind of appeals to me. I played um, Rome Total War. I don't know if anybody knows that that game, but that's what really got me into it. Every time I saw something about Rome growing up, it piqued my interest. That game really opened, got me interested in it, and that led me to the History of Rome podcast. If anybody is interested in Roman history, you must listen to that podcast. It is hands down the best. Go ahead. Not much. Uh, slavery was ubiquitous. Um, slaves were freed and became freedmen, um, but they were treated as second-class citizens. But there was slavery throughout this whole thing. It ebbed and flowed with, uh, with conquests, basically. What the price of slave changed? I, I, assume, I assume the price of slavery fluctuated and changed with all other prices, uh, tending towards inflation, because you're going to pay for your slaves with, with silver coinage. So It wasn't separate, no, no. It, but I, I mean, slaves were a commodity like corn, and wine, and anything else. So it wasn't. But it, uh, it was not affected somehow particularly. I've never heard of a specific effect, no. Uh, but again, I'm not a historian. There, there. I've never looked into that specifically. Um, so, but in my, in my, you know, research for this and my general research in Roman. History, slavery is very important to Roman history, but it's not particular, particularly involved in this in a special way uh, as opposed to other goods and services. Oh, absolutely. And, and the, the emperor owned thousands, and that was basically the bureaucracy was slaves of the emperor and also freedmen and stuff like that. But yeah, so slavery is a big reason why the republic fell and the empire rose, but that's a different topic, that's a different discussion. Maybe this is a different topic as well, but the way I learned this was, and I took Italian here. Of course, yeah. Um, that the Roman Empire uh, expanded too, I guess, whatever, they expanded too far. Mm -hmm. I don't think it contradicts it. It's generally in line with it. Um, it wasn't really the empire that expanded too far. It was the, re the Republic did most of the expansion. The empire really just was stagnant land-wise. Every once in a while, an, am an ambitious emperor would conquer some new land. Uh, in the case of Great of Britain, that land was conquered and then held on to for hundreds of years. Um, in the case of Dacia, which is north of the Danube, uh, uh, Trajan conquered it, and then his, uh, his successor gave it right back because it was just too hard to hold on to. So the empire didn't really expand very much. They would go across their borders and, and conquer people and take slaves, but then they would leave those places and not really institute their, their rule. But what you said is, is generally true. It, it got so bad that when the barbarians eventually came in, it doesn't appear to me that there was much strife about it. The Romans of Italy switched from listening to the empires to listening to the, uh, the Lombards and the, and the Vandals 
it was just a different guy telling, to, you know, collecting taxes from them. They paid him, and hopefully he left them alone. So, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, he's, he raised his hand quite a few times. Go ahead. Yes. And does that explain like, how, first off, like how long was there a famine before emperors took control of recording it? Okay. Also, was there any price inflation before the emperors took control of it? Okay. So, I'll go back to this one. So, Rome is founded in 753 BC, and this is right around the time when they first start, we first find uh, coinage in Greece. So coinage is invented right around the founding of Rome. I'm sure it took some time for it to come over to Rome, but somewhere in this period, the Roman Senate starts issuing coinage, and they are the ones who control the, the mines, the mints, and the coinage. And I'm not, there, there may have been fluctuations in between, but by the time we get to the emperors, it's still at 95%. So, you know, between coinage being uh, started being used, which I, I, the assumption is, is that when coinage is used, it's a hundred percent the precious metal that it's purported to be, because the implementation of it is just to standardize the weight of the precious metal. People are still considering the precious metal as the thing with value. They're not considering the stamp on the coin as the thing is uh, that has value. It's after long-term usage that that perception of value switches over to it's just the stamp that does it. But even then, um, when Augustus takes over in uh, the late first century, it's at 95%. So from that, we can conclude that the Senate did a pretty good job of maintaining the integrity of the coinage. My assumption is because there were rivaling factions that um, you know, if another faction wanted to debase the currency, this faction found political profit in telling everybody about it. And, um, you know, if you were politically savvy, you, you didn't do it. <laughs> you didn't fall through. Kind of like Jeffco. Jeffco got some pushback on their gun thing, and look at that. It all comes full circle. So, yeah, I hope that answers that. Yes, yep. And then uh, Augustus explicitly takes over all of the mints and the issuance of coinage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we talk about Diocletian and how basically he wrecked the whole empire, mm -hmm. how does that compare with like other major disasters by governments throughout history? Like say the Great Leap Forward or the Bolshevik Revolution. Like, do you think that was maybe one of the worst government mismanagements ever? Or I would say the central planning of the Soviet Union was uh, I've never found anything that baffled me more than that. Um, but this is right up there. I mean, for me, se telling people that they can't switch professions is absolutely ridiculous. I don't understand what that was. It, it's, it's a time of chaos. And so anything that resembles stability, I assume, is looked at as a good idea by Diocletian. And so that's something they that did. So I, I, I would say it's up there. Um, there weren't, well, there were mass killings just, but it was Christians. It was for a different reason. It wasn't for economic reasons. It was for religious reasons. Um, so it, it was bad, but who's, who's to, I mean, comparing these things is kind of difficult. I would say the Great Leap Forward and the Soviet Union central planning was probably worse, but this is a close third. It's, uh, so I don't think we are in, in the empire stage. I think we're in the fall of the republic stage. Um, so, and, and the republic was technically an empire. An empire is defined, at least for me, by a, a government that rules over multiple cultures. And the republic definitely satisfied that definition. Um, I would say we are at the fall of the republic. Uh, if you look into the fall of the republic, uh, I. I think of Trump as Sulla. And if that name doesn't, if you don't recognize that name, that's very, I mean, it's not a very well-known name, but he was uh, sort of, the th he came about 100 years before Julius Caesar. He was a conservative guy who made horrible decisions that uh, really 
hurt, hurt the integrity of the Republic and crack the foundations and open the door for somebody like Julius Caesar to come in and just take power uh, almost completely. So I would say we're at the fall of the Republic, which is why I'm generally a depressed person, because that means we have about 500 years of uh, bad times ahead of us. Um, but, you know, I could be wrong. I, you know, it's also, um, again, it, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison, because we also, a major theme of the end of the empire was that uh, people no longer really had um, faith in the, uh, the religion of the government. Um, lots of people were abandoning the, the paganism for a different belief system, and that caused a lot of chaos as well. And I think we're in that, the belief system that they were switching to was Christianity, and the ir irony is now we see people switching away from Christianity to whatever else that they can find. But it's, that's a parallel as well, and that would put us down here. So it depends on how you look at it. It's an interesting thing to think about. It's one of the reasons why I'm very much into Roman history because it, it's kind of interesting to match it up to our own times. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. I'll get you. Oh. I can keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you see this, some people say it's more like what Rome was like as it was more of an empire. Some people say it was also there's a lot of smoke and mirrors. One in particular, uh, you see a video of him called the uh, French or the guy from Paris and USA. Oh, okay. Uh, KFC Napolitano. Uh, okay, that I recognize that name. Yeah. Uh, Ventura Park in Canada. I think it's Jeff Stepanov. Okay. And, uh, Yeah. Maybe conservative libertarian uh, other voices might challenge the world vision or go ultra left or something like that. Maybe we do see more like a more centralized vision of a break up of the rich and the Yeah, it's hard to say because I'm hopeful and you don't know how that affects your judgment. Uh, but the hopeful side of me hopes that we're over here and not over here. And, and uh, to that point, um, if you go to completecolorado.com, you will find an article of Polis just recently said that he wants Colorado to begin accepting taxes in crypto by this summer. He wants to do that. I don't know if he's just you know, campaigning or not, but you're right, this is, this is happening where people are losing faith in the dollar and beginning to switch over, which makes me very hopeful because if you ask me, the fall of the Roman Empire was, I mean, it was a really good, it was a best case scenario. Um, the more I look into Western Europe after the Roman, or during the fall of the Roman Empire, it wasn't, oh, today we're in the Roman Empire and tomorrow, now we're not, now we're in something else. It was this gradual decay of, of imperial power where just the emperors, just people stopped paying attention to the governors that the emperors would send, or the governors would stop paying attention to the emperor. It was really this great slow decline of power into, now, the things that Diocletian did meant that what came after wasn't that great, but it wasn't this cataclysmic destruction um, of the power. It was a very slow process. I mean, it was that as, the, as far as the hyperinflation, but as far as the way regime changes happen now, where one day this guy's in power and the next day this guy's in power, that's not really what happened with the fall of the entire Roman Empire. It was pretty gradual and um, uh, it, it was, I mean, when I hear people talk about the hopeful of, 
uh, the hope of making government obsolete. This was some, somewhat like that. They didn't make government obsolete, but they made the Roman government obsolete, and different governments came in and, and took over. But it was very, it was, what's that? The church did, absolutely, yeah. And, and the church was really, um, I'm reading The Decline and Fall of Rome right now, and his description of the church is, um, I mean, it's not, it's not perfect, obviously, but it is a voluntary association that uh, operated like a government that you know you could cho choose to join and choose not to join. That changed, obviously. <laughs> uh, but I think that that's a general that changes that always changes, you know. Um, but yeah, so I, I hope that we are in the 500s A.D. and that people will just gradually go. You know what? That's not working for us. We're going to start paying attention to these guys. And I mean, hopefully, we go. We're not going to pay attention to anybody, but. Exactly. Yeah. I hope so. And I think so. I think so. And I and I think our the way it's divided right now, where it they are the states are separate governments, uh, will facilitate that because it won't be, you know, we have nothing, you, you know. We would love it if we just switched to nothing, but most people wouldn't go for that, and so it's kind of nice that we have these, not yet, that's right, but it's nice that we have these built-in smaller governments that we can switch to. We could, people don't realize this now, but we could just stop paying attention to the federal government, and they wouldn't really be able to do much about it, unless they wanted to commit horrible atrocities and then exacerbate the problem. Exactly. Exactly. It might lash out, but it's not going to help it if it did. But that's hopeful. That's wishful thinking. Um, but who knows? We might be at the fall of the republic, which means a strong man comes along and everybody thinks that he'll fix it and they give him all the power to do so. And then, you know, that lasts for a long time. That lasts for a very long time. Yeah, definitely hard to say. Yeah. Okay. After the fall of the Roman Empire, what did they go after? Well, um, when Diocletian implemented those reforms, it pretty much went back to a barter system. Those reforms pretty much pushed it back to a barter system. The debasement of the currency meant that they didn't have any currency. And to answer your first question, not really. Rome is the, they own the entire Mediterranean, which is effectively the known world for those people. There's deserts on both on the eastern edge and the southern edge of that territory that makes trade between the east, the far east, and the west pretty, pretty uh, scarce. So there's not going to be an importation of other currencies in the amount that's going to be able to make a difference. They, they own the entire world, basically, and so there's no competing currencies. After the fall, um, I'm sure uh, the, the Merovingians came in and took over France. I'm sure they uh, instituted currency. I didn't look into that for this presentation. And the Middle Ages between the end of the Roman Empire and the beginning of uh, the English monarchy, I'm pretty uh, vague on that. I haven't looked too much into that. British history and Roman history are my two big passions. So. Not really. They did know about each other, and they did trade uh, somewhat, but there wasn't there wasn't enough trade to where they they people could go. Oh, I'm going to use that currency. Uh, you know. That's generally what the gold coins were used for uh, uh, was savings. Um, I in my research for this, people didn't talk about the gold coins very much. It's mostly focused on the silver coins. So I'm not sure if they debase the, I assume they debase the gold as well. Um, but people are going to hold on to their gold to, uh, to store their wealth. And they're not going it, to, it's not exchanged so much that you're going to be able to 
you know, when you debase a currency that's exchanged quite a bit, people lose their good coins and get their bad coins before even realizing that it's happening. Whereas gold isn't traded as much unless you're making a huge purchase. So if you institute debased gold, it's not going to spread around the empire as quickly as silver will. The velocity of silver uh, in, ter in economic terms is far higher than the velocity of gold. And so that's where the profit would be the major profit of debasement would come from. Thank you.